Hello friends, Killer B here. As a good number of rail shipments are destined beyond the railroad they are loaded on, railroads exchange cars with each other, called interchange. A few people have asked how this is accomplished, so I figured I would make a quick video, as the general concept is simple. Well, of course, explaining that ballooned into a bigger project than I originally anticipated, but here we go. Many of my images will be from back in the day when things were more colorful, but the principles illustrated are the same. Interchange of freight was not always by one railroad giving cars to another. Originally, railroad tracks were often of different gauges, that is, the distance between the rails. So when a railroad had hauled a load to the end of its line, the product often had to be taken out of the car and reloaded into a new car on the next railroad. In 1861, only about half of the country's rail mileage was at today's standard gauge of four foot eight and one half inches. In 1863, Congress set this as the gauge for the Transcontinental Railroad. In the following decades, the railroads converted to this, allowing the interchange of cars from one railroad to another. But you still could have the issue of cars being different and not, for instance, coupling to another railroad's cars. So the standardization of the freight cars was required too. Plus a procedure had to be worked out when the repair to someone else's car was required and for the usage charges. Eventually the track gauge and freight car design and other issues were standardized. Still, other factors came into play initially preventing full interchange. Sometimes where two railroads crossed, one of them did not want to participate in constructing an interchange track and had to be ordered to do so. And sometimes a railroad insisted on transferring the freight of a shipment received from a connecting railroad into their own cars. In 1911, the Interstate Commerce Commission called upon the railroads to unite to constitute a national system and reminded them that they were required to serve the through routes which they had established with other carriers. Where the tracks of two different railroad companies crossed, there was often a track connecting them. If the number of cars to exchange was small, they would simply be left on the connecting track. As we see here with the CSX leaving cars at Reynolds, Indiana for the Toledo, Peoria and Western. Sometimes there would be two such connecting tracks. We see here the Elgin, Joliet and Eastern and Wisconsin Central interchange at their Leithton, Illinois crossing. There were two tracks, one for the WC to deliver to the J on and one for the J to deliver to the WC on, as seen in 1988. If the amount of traffic to exchange was more robust, there would often be an interchange yard. Here we see the Conrail and Elgin, Joliet and Eastern interchange yard at Pine, Indiana, next to the EJ and East Kirkyard and alongside the Conrail main line. Multiple railroads could interchange in the same yard. In the Detroit terminal, the Grand Trunk Western had a yard at West Detroit. They would bring cars to for the CNO and NNW. Likewise, CNO and NNW brought their interchange cars here for the GTW. Regardless, the general principle was the same. When Railroad A placed cars on a designated interchange track for Railroad B, the cars were then considered delivered to Railroad B. Railroad-controlled cars carry a rental charge called per dime, and yes, that is how the railroads pronounce it. It was originally a daily charge, and whoever had the car at midnight had to pay that day's per dime to the car owner. This gave rise to what were known as per dime runs, when a railroad would make every effort to deliver cars to another railroad prior to midnight and avoid a day's worth of charges on the cars. In 1977, per dime was changed from daily to hourly, 
and is now referred to as car hire. A lot of branch lines were sustained by interchange traffic before staggers, that is, the legislation in 1980 that deregulated the industry. Ladd, Illinois was famous as a point out in the country that CNW, CB&Q, Milwaukee Road, New York Central, and LaSalle and Bureau County all ran to. Originally, it was a coal-producing area, and New York Central used it as a high-wide route around Chicago. But in later years, it was primarily an interchange point. As railroads concentrated as much traffic as possible on fewer lines, the branch lines sustained by interchange traffic became uneconomical relics. The railroads often referred to large cities as terminals. In fact, many local railroads had the word terminal in their name. Detroit Terminal, Kansas City Terminal, Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis. Gateway was another term for locations where large numbers of cars were exchanged. In terminal areas, there were several ways interchange worked. It was all basically the same. One railroad left cars for another. But there are many scenarios of how that was done. One way was a railroad would run a transfer job from their yard to another railroad yard to deliver cars. Here we see the Chicago and Northwestern transfer from Proviso Yard, delivering to the Wisconsin Central at Schiller Park in the Chicago Terminal. Traditionally, the transfer runs were only in one direction. A railroad would deliver cars to another railroad and return home as a caboose hop, that is, just the engines and the caboose. Eventually, agreements were made allowing a railroad to handle cars in both directions. So sometimes the railroads would trade off to equalize the expense. Railroad A would deliver and pull from Railroad B for a given number of months. Then Railroad B would deliver and pull from Railroad A for a given number of months. Here we see the Illinois Central 0700 transfer coming off their railroad at Kensington in the Chicago Terminal and onto the Chicago, South Shore, and South Bend Railroad. They will set out their cars for the South Shore on the right, then head down a little ways and leave cars for the Chicago Rail Link. A few years later, under Canadian National Operation, we see the interchange now being made at 95th Street on the Illinois Central's tracks. In this shot, the 11 o'clock recycle job is tying onto the cars left by the South Shore and will take them back to Markham Yard to switch out. And another variation, the Sioux Line has brought a wheat train into Chicago and onto the IC tracks and left it west of Ash Street and returned home with their power. The IC has tied onto it with their power and crew and is preparing to depart. Oh, did you spot the llama? Short lines often interchanged by either running into the yards of their connections, as seen here at Logansport, Indiana, where the Toledo, Peoria, and Western is in the Norfolk Southern Yard picking up, or exchanging cars using an interchange track which often is just a siding, as Tomahawk Rail is doing here, delivering cars to the CN at Tomahawk, Wisconsin. The role of terminal switch roads comes into play with interchange. In a larger terminal like Chicago or St. Louis, where many railroads connect, it would cause a lot of congestion if every railroad was running transfer jobs to every other railroad to deliver cars. Instead, the trunk lines, or road haul lines, as the mainline railroads were called, would bring to what are known as terminal or intermediate switching railroads the cars they had for multiple connecting railroads, thus doing with one transfer job what would otherwise require multiple jobs. The terminal railroads would switch the cars and arrange delivery of the cars to the connecting outbound railroads. So instead of this, you have this. 
The terminal railroads assess the per car switch charge against the delivering railroad, unless agreements were made to the contrary. The Belt Railway Company of Chicago has a large yard called Clearing Yard, as it was designed to be the clearing house in Chicago for railroad interchange. That all said, if any given two railroads interchanged a lot of traffic with each other, they would usually still continue to do this directly and save the expense of the switch charges. Here is a Conrail train out of Elkhart, Indiana, rolling through East Chicago headed for the Chicago and Northwestern's Proviso Yard. Here are some interchange moves I came across one day in 1996 at the Elgin Joliet and Eastern South Chicago Yard. First, the EJ&E transfer from Kirkyard and Gary arrived with cars for the Chicago Rail Link and the Belt Railway Company of Chicago. Then the Chicago Rail Link arrived with their cars for the EJ&E. They left those cars, grabbed their cars from the EJ&E, and departed. The EG&E followed them over to Commercial Avenue, where their cars for the Belt Railway were delivered in the Belt's yard. Upon their arrival there, the Belt Railway job departed for the EG&E South Chicago yard with the cars for the EG&E. They returned back to Commercial Avenue light power, upon which the EG&E departed with their engines back to South Chicago. Anything was possible. Here is a 1964 agreement providing for the Indiana Harbor Belt to move across their railroad trains between the Grand Trunk Western and the Milwaukee Road in the Chicago Terminal, as these two railroads did not directly connect with each other. Originally, it was with IHB crews, engines, and caboose, but was amended in 1982 to account for the Milwaukee Road and Grand Trunk running their power and cabooses through, with IHB just supplying a crew to move the trains. Cars were considered as interchanged directly between the GTW at Blue Island and the Milwaukee Road at Bensonville. So even though the IHB was manning and moving the trains across their railroad, cars were not shown as interchanged to them. The last scenario is run-through trains. When traffic was sufficient between two railroads to interchange entire trains at a time, they often would operate right through a terminal without being switched there, decreasing congestion and speeding the traffic. A good example is a unit train, such as coal, grain, molten sulfur, etc., whose power and marker stay on the train its entire cycle. Here is an empty unit coal train rolling through suburban Chicago. It had originally loaded in Wyoming on BNSF, who brought it to Chicago and delivered it to the Norfolk Southern, engines and all. The NS took it to Ohio, where it unloaded, and has brought it back to Chicago and delivered it back to the BNSF. At the change in railroads, time and hassle are saved by not having to exchange locomotives and marker, which back in the day would have been a caboose. An example of a merchandise train is the Norfolk Southern train out of Elkhart, Indiana, destined to the Union Pacific at North Platte, Nebraska. It rolls right through Chicagoland without doing any work, just changing crews. The power and marker stay on. Whoops, thought of one more interchange that is unique. When the railroads operated the car ferries across Lake Michigan from Michigan to Wisconsin, here are both the CNO and the Ann Arbor Railroad boats at Kewanee, Wisconsin in 1980, where they connected with the Green Bay and Western. So just when was the car considered interchanged? Car Service Rule 7 states when the car is placed on the track agreed upon and designated as the interchange track. The receiving carrier is allowed to designate the location they desire the delivering carrier to deliver at, and to provide a free route over its tracks to that point for the delivering carrier, if necessary. 
The two railroads involved will have an interchange agreement designating the track or tracks to deliver on and clarifying exactly when the car is considered interchanged, usually when the delivering road cuts away its engines. Here is a summary of agreements covering interchange between the Texas Mexican Railway and the Missouri Pacific and the National Railways of Mexico at Laredo, Texas. This page from the Grand Trunk Western's car control manual for the Chicago area designated how interchanging was to be handled for cars flowing through their Blue Island yard. Also, forwarding instructions are required. Back in the day, a paper waybill accompanied each car as it moved. The train's conductor would receive all the waybills for his train at the start of his trip and turn them in at the end, as we see in this photo of a CNW conductor getting off his caboose at Clinton, Iowa, clutching his waybills, which he will turn in at the yard office. In the case of when they delivered cars on remote interchange tracks, the waybills would often be left in the bill box, there for the receiving roads conductor to take, which was often the mailbox mounted on a pole. Waybills no longer exist. The conductor now will either have a computer-generated train list of all the cars with all the pertinent information, or a tablet. Whichever it is, all the information formerly shown on the movement waybills is now electronically transmitted from the delivering carrier to the receiving carrier. Hopefully you've gained some insight into how the interchanging of freight cars between railroads worked and works. As usual, what was intended as a small project kept growing. Now, passenger cars and entire passenger trains were interchanged or run through also, but that is outside the scope of this video. Also, I am not going into railroad to industry interchanges, using the term loosely, other than to say that many industries have their own locomotives or trackmobile, or engage the services of a contract switching outfit. The railroad will just drop off and pull cars from the industry tracks and the industry handles their own switching. Large customers might have the usage of a yard that the railroad will drop and pull cars from. Feel free to subscribe as more videos are always coming and here is a link to other videos. Thank you. Bye for now.